So you can see a clear-cut example from nature where you have many, many simple, relatively simple interacting units behaving collectively in a very complex way. It looks like it's purposeful. Um, so, in a sense, that's an analogy for how the brain might work. Okay, maybe consciousness is an emergent property of the brain in the way that that kind of complex behavior is an emergent property of, of, uh, of those birds that have flocked. So you see the same kinds of behavior in, in, in other parts of nature. So you can see them, for example, in, in termite colonies and ant colonies, where, the co where collectively these colonies seem to behave in a very purposeful manner, and they all survive because they behave in that way. But each ant on its own has no idea what the collective is doing, how the collective is behaving. Okay? So, as Triani and Tucci said, an ant is part of a colony much as a neuron is part of a brain. It can't do much in isolation, but as a colony, it's a highly resilient adaptive system. Okay? So, in other words, ants and neurons act harmoniously with other conspecifics, other neurons, to accomplish tasks that go well beyond the capacity of a single individual. So the reason that our brains can do what they can do is because you have mass action on the part of many, many interacting neurons. So no individual ant in a colony is aware of all the possible alternatives. But nevertheless, you, you do get this very complex, self-organized pattern emerging um, at the mass level. Okay. But hang on a minute. This is beginning to sound a little bit like Dennett. Remember what Dennett said. By yoking these independently evolved specialist organs in common cause, thereby giving their union vastly enhanced powers, this virtual machine, the software of the brain, performs a sort of political miracle. It creates a virtual captain of the crew. But it also sounds suspiciously like property dualism. What's all that about? Okay, so high-level phenomena are emerging from low-level ones but can't be explained in terms of their properties. You can't explain this mass behavior in terms of the interactions of these simple units. Well, this is where David Chalmers comes in. He talks about two different forms of emergence. You've got weak emergence, where high-level phenomena do emerge from the low-level domain, but there is that explanatory power. Okay? You can still deduce the behavior of the, of the high-level phenomena in terms of the lower-level one. At the other extreme, you've got strong emergence, and this is the argument that actually Chalmers buys. He says that, look, you can get high-level phenomena like consciousness, and they arise from low-level phenomena like the brain. But there's nothing about the high-level phenomenon that you can reduce to the lower-level phenomenon, even in principle. Forget about data, he's saying even in principle. Okay. Now, I'll leave you with one last video. In fact, there's not much time. I'll let you watch that video on its own. Um, and I'll just say that there's something important in his argument called irreducibility. So it's been suggested that consciousness is an emergent property. You've got weak emergence, and that's a form of emergence that relates to reductionism and neurophilosophy, and strong emergence, which is irreducibility. Okay? So he's saying that you can't reduce the high-level phenomenon of consciousness to its lower-level um, arguments.